All right, they're both recording. Let's go. All right, so uh, what are we talking about today in class? What did we talk about last time? Any takers? Oh, also, if you came in late, come talk to me after class. So I just mark you down as here. Takers, what, are, what did we talk about last class? I, I gave it the very exciting title of the most boring part of the semester. Professional ethics. Yeah, professional ethics. So what do we mean by professional ethics? You have the skill, knowledge, and you get paid. Yeah, so it's basically, if you're a professional, you're somebody who's doing a job and getting paid for it. And not only is it a job, it's a job that not everybody can do. So for instance, there's not professional shoelace tires. Everyone knows how to tie their own shoes by the time they're like eight, or they just go with Velcro, which is what I would do for a while, which is way better. Like, all adult shoes should be Velcro. Um, so that's my, my main view on this matter. Okay, so with a professional though, you have to have, because the person is so specialized, you need to have special ethical practices to make sure that everyone who is in that field behaves well. And why did we say that you need special ethical practices for professionals? It's not just that they have specialized knowledge, it's what about that specialized knowledge? Certified. Say that again? Certified by the board. Yeah, so it gets, you have to have a board overlooking it to make sure that everyone is behaving in an appropriate way. And, but why was it? Why don't, um, you know, certain types of jobs don't have a, an oversight board? Like dog walkers generally don't have like a major oversight board, but a doctor does. What's the big difference between dog walkers and doctors? I mean, there's no big skill difference from like, well, there's a big skill difference, but it's like, you walking a dog is not gonna bring any harm about it. You just, uh, yeah, so if you're a really bad dog walker, what's the worst that happens? The dog gets hit by a car. The dog gets hit by a car, which is very tragic, but also society's not gonna like collapse because of it. If the head of say Mount Sinai, or Mount Sinai surgery is a terrible doctor, what happens? People die and the major hospital goes out of business. The stakes are much, much higher. In the same way, what was one specifically relevant uh, set of, or profession to this class? Yeah. yeah, information technology, computering, computering, yes, the act of computering. Um, no, so any sort of programming or that sort of thing is a profession because not everybody can do it. And in the same way, computer, uh, IT professionals have to be held to a higher standard because what happens if IT programs go wrong? What are some of the potential problems? What are some of the things that are run off computers these days? Uh, information can be leaked. Yeah, so information can be leaked. So if, what sorts of information might be lost if somebody in, say, a cybersecurity division at a big company doesn't do their job well? Yeah, your credit card information can go. Any sort of internal workings of that company can go. So imagine also it's a company that, say, designs missiles. What if that cybersecurity division isn't very good? Where does that information go? Uh, Whoever wants that information, exactly. Or what are some other things that are, name something you encountered today that was run off of computers. Come on, something, you personally all got to John Jay today after having oh. woken up. In transit. Any sort of mass transit being run partially off of computer systems. Or, uh, so a lot of like, Plane, airplane uh, systems are run off of computers these days. Imagine if those didn't work right. Or how does a nuclear power plant work? Do people know what basically what nuclear power is? You get a whole bunch of atoms and then you break them apart and in the process of breaking atomic bonds it creates a ton of energy. Now the problem with nuclear power is what? Yeah, stuff can go wrong and when it goes wrong, stuff goes really wrong. Like, really wrong to the point of there are parts of the Ukraine near Chernobyl that nobody can still live even though it's like 40 years ago because there's too much radiation. If you go there, you die. So that's what happens if a nuclear power plant melts down. What is in charge of making sure nuclear power plants don't melt down? Because it has to, for the, the reactions to happen without melting down, it has to happen at a very precise temperature and in a very specifically controlled environment. What's in charge of making sure that those environments are correct? Is it somebody standing there with like a little heater? No, it's all computerized. So if the computer system goes wrong, nuclear power plants melt down. Missile systems go awry. So this is why you need professional ethics because the stakes are so high. So if I, as a teacher, start teaching you poorly, stuff goes wrong and you waste your money on education. But it's not as bad as if like a nuclear missile goes awry which is why there has to be more oversight, or if a doctor starts doing something wrong. 
um, things go poorly. And because it's this profession, the only other people who are qualified to recognize whether things are going well or poorly from a moral perspective are other professionals, which means you need systems in place to make sure that the people in the profession are behaving well, because if they aren't, then it's not simply a matter of, you know, the dog that you said you were walking doesn't get walked and pooped on the floor. It's rather like a nuclear power plant melts down. And like dogs pooping on the floor is a pain, but nuclear power meltdowns are worse. Um, just one thing to learn today, that's it. Um, all right, so how then, we finished up last time and talking about what's the main way within computer science though that uh, regulation or people make sure so it, with doctors, you've got this board that's in charge of coming up with all these tests that people have to pass, and if you stop being a good doctor, you lose your license, you're not allowed to practice. In uh, information technology, though, what's the main way that people are kept in line or make sure that computer technology, or I mean, information technology workers actually behave morally or in a way that is good for society? Is there anything like the medical board no, there's no overarching system. Is there anything like a test you have to take to prove that you're moral enough or that you're good enough at this? Basically, the only people who might give you a test are the companies themselves that you're applying to work for, but there's no overarching test. And so what, do these, what is generally relied upon? What's the company policy? Pardon? The company policy? Yeah, company policies, or the word we use last time, codes of conduct. Yeah. You basically sign a document that says, while well, I work for this company, I won't do this or this or this. And the issues with that are that they're, well, what were some of the issues with having the main thing be a code of conduct? If the codes of conduct are the main way to keep people behaving well in a certain profession, what are some of the worries you might have? And this is kind of tough, touching on things we talked about last time, kind of touching on new things. So what, if you find out that the only thing that keeps kept doctors uh, behaving well was that they signed a piece of paper at the start when they started working for a particular hospital, what would be some of the worries you might have? Yeah, just because the company is willing to give them a job doesn't necessarily mean they're super well experienced. So a company will sometimes give a job to someone because as long as, no worries, as long as that person is able to do a job that the company's happy with, they might not be as, like hold a worker to as high of a standard as you as a patient would. Uh, what are some other worries here? So in an IT profession, what is something that could go wrong if the only thing that IT professionals are held to by, in terms of doing right and wrong are these codes of conduct? Well, who writes the codes of conduct? The company, and what's the possible worry about the company deciding that's right or wrong? Yeah, what if the company doesn't really give a damn about society as a whole and only cares about making money? Or what if the CEO is a terrible person who doesn't really care about many of these things and isn't gonna hold himself or herself to the standards of the code of conduct? So part of the worry is the code of conduct only as good as the power to enforce it. And in many cases, like if, with the medical board, if something goes wrong, you lose your license. With a company, if the company doesn't care what you're doing and doesn't fire you, there's not really, like even if your, your company says, we will not accept any sort of sexual harassment or discrimination in this workplace. But what do you need for that policy to actually go through? You still get the enforcement. Yeah, you need enforcement. And if a company doesn't care and there's no external enforcement and as long as the company's still making money, then they generally won't care. So that's one issue with codes of conduct, is it's almost like you can't police yourself. It's a sort of reason of you can't have the, def the defendant's mother on a jury. Like why can't you have the defendant's mother on a jury? Well, because what's the mother gonna say? Yeah, they're gonna be biased. You're never gonna find your own child guilty of murder. Unless like you know that the child, I mean, I guess if you watched, but even then most parents would be like, oh, the person deserved it. Uh, <laughs> because it's your own child. In the same way, if you're the company, you don't necessarily have a reason to, to hold people to these standards. And another one is just like, these sorts of standards are incredibly vague. Did we talk about this at all last time? The vagueness in these standards? Um, so, one of the things that, um, in the textbook, one of the codes of conduct from one of these big, a whole bunch of letters stuck together that I can never remember, S, E, T, C, S, Q, yeah. Uh, one of their ones was, um, Respect 
privacy. That's one of the things in the Code of Conduct. It just says respect privacy. What's the possible issue with this? Yeah, it's weak and... Like it leaves an interpretation of yeah, what's privacy. Right? Exactly, it leaves open what's privacy. And what you think of as privacy and what they think of as privacy are not necessarily going to be the same thing. Um, pardon? Yeah, exactly. What constitutes respect? So, uh, for those of you who are watching the recording right now, I'm looking directly at you. This is going to be a bit of a repeat from what just came like 10 minutes before. I'm sorry about that. All right. Um, so, anyone know what I'm drawing right now? Cylinder. Yep. What type of cylinder? There we go. We have an Alexa. That's Alexa. Uh, I was trying to decide what to make Alexa uh, say. What? Why am I drawing an Alexa up here with respect privacy? Something that came into the news within the past couple months. Anyone know? Yeah. So do people know what was happening? Of why Amazon and Apple with Siri and Google with the Google Assistant, same thing was happening. Um, each one of these. How were they deciding? So. If you're running this company, you want to make sure that Siri is doing her job well, or Alexa is doing her job well. And the one way to do this is to make sure that the, the questions being asked of Alexa are actually getting the responses that you want those questions to get responses to. So if somebody asks, what's the capital of Egypt, you don't have them like giving you grandma's apple pie recipe. You want to make sure that it works well. And so how were they running this quality control? So just turn it on, turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. Yeah, so what it would be is, when, um, so it's not necessarily that the mic was always on. Sometimes the mic goes on by accident. But more often what it was was whatever was being asked, where was this then sent? Where was this information sent? To the database. To call center. So it went to a database. And then there was actually a room full of people listening in to what the responses were and then grading them. Like, oh, this, yes. Oh, this, yes. So these, this is in pr uh, practice. Doesn't seem like such a huge deal, but it is kind of weird that nobody knew that Alexa was listening in on them. So thus far, kind of a problem. But does anyone know why this became a huge news story? There was no point in like picking up things that shouldn't have been. Yeah, exactly. So how many of you accidentally turned on Alexa? Or how many of you have accidentally turned on Siri? How many of you have accidentally turned on your Google Assistant? If you have it, then you're like me who just keeps it off and never turns it on because you don't like the idea of it. So when you accidentally turn it on, it's not always in a time that you want it necessarily turned on. So what was the major thing that was making news of very often Alexa or Siri was getting turned on during? Intimate. Intimate moments. Yeah. It turned out that Siri's voice activation wasn't great and the sound of a zipper unzipping would turn her on sometimes. <laughs> also, Google or Apple Watches have a button on the side that would sometimes get pressed, and if it's held down, it automatically goes to Siri. And you can imagine how in an intimate moment that button might get held down. And therefore, it would then send a live audio recording to a call center of people sitting there listening to what was happening on the other end. Needless to say that this was not ideal. Other things that were listened in on were drug deals, where people literally tr were in the middle of a drug deal and accidentally turned on their Siri, and somebody in the call center was just like, oh, there's a drug deal happening now. Uh, they couldn't do anything about it because they didn't really care, and they thought they, they didn't have any reason to. But all right, when Apple was found out about, like when Apple, this became public, what was the response of these companies at first? Does anyone know what they said originally? When basically it came out, People in a room are listening to you having sex through your Siri without you knowing it. First off, how many of you feel like your privacy is being respected if this is happening? No. Nobody feels that way. Except what did the companies say? Were they respecting your privacy? Well, I mean, they said it was like anonymized, so like yeah. they're not going to know who you are. Exactly. They said, no, they don't know who you are. Like, you dear person who's having sex and we're listening, we don't actually know who you are, so therefore you're private. And also, what else did they say? You also signed a user agreement. Yeah, you signed a user agreement, and the user agreement says, I give Apple permission to use my data for quality control. And they said that that right there constituted telling you that somebody might be listening in. 
And because they didn't match it up to who you were, uh, it still counts as privacy. How many of you feel this counts as privacy? So some people do. How many people are still like, this is definitely invading my privacy, you're listening to me have sex? Like, literally there were people in a room listening to you have sex. Like, I feel like if at any point the answer is, like, they are listening to you have sex without you knowing some sort of privacy has been violated. And so, like, here's a way in which the company's code of conduct says, we and our employees are respecting your privacy. But the way they defined it is so vague that this sort of practice is allowed for us. But I also think it comes down to like common sense. I mean, the same thing could be applied to like you having sex or leaving your window open in broad daylight. Like that's not the comp that's not the window company's fault. That jerk's not thinking. I mean, you have a microphone in your your room. And so yeah, and I think this is like the sort of thing is there's this degree to which people, and this is the sort of sense in which we have to think back to what we um we're talking about in terms of thinking of the consequences and how sometimes consequentialism can be flawed because people cannot predict everything that they're doing. And so, in the one sense, like if you know how Alexa works and you know how Siri works, then there's this sort of sense of like, oh yeah, I need to be extra careful about this. But if you're, like how many of your grandparents, somebody has decided to be cute to get them an Alexa because then they'd be able to like ask funny questions or do whatever with the Alexa. But like this person has no idea how the internet works, so they don't even quite know what Alexa is. And so there's a sense of like, oh, on the one hand, yes, you should know if you have a knowledge of the technology. And if you know the technology, it's very common sense, which is why there's some people in this room, myself included, who just don't use Siri, because if you never have her turned on, she can't ever listen to you. But if you don't necessarily even know, like my dad has no idea. He just knows that if he talks to his phone, he doesn't have to type anything. And because he can't see worth a damn, it really helps him. Um, but that's the sort of worries that we have with these codes of conduct, which means that in a regular workplace or in a profession like doctoring, where there's this big board in place, you don't have a lot of these vaguenesses because there's somebody in charge. I mean, you're still going to run into them, but there are very set rules, and if you break this, somebody fires you or you lose your license. In this sort of case, there's no governing body to say, hey, Apple, you messed up. Uh, we need to like shut you down because there is no like IT governing body. Eventually, they have shut down these practices, and how what led them to? Who caused them to? You're looking at them all right now. Consumers, consumers and users got mad and threatened to stop using the prop the products, or just started looking for competitors, and which was kind of hard because they were all doing it. But uh, it was basically people got pissed off enough that these companies agreed to it. But that's basically the only way it happens. And the problem with this is, what's the problem of relying on a public outcry to make sure things don't happen? Is the public, the public also wrong this time? Sometimes the public is wrong, but also, uh, you need like enough numbers. You need enough people to understand it and care about it. And the first step is, even though Google and Apple and uh, Microsoft were all carrying out these these behaviors, they weren't announcing that they were doing it. So until somebody came along and said, you know this is happening with your Alexa, right? Nobody could get mad about it. Because many of these things, they don't. it's not like they come out and say, oh, by the way, we've been listening in to a lot of people having sex in Alexa. That's not like one of the, when you read about the great uh, benefits of having an Alexa, they never include on the packaging, strangers might listen to you having sex <laughs> as one of the great benefits. So this is the sort of worry. It's just like these codes of conduct are vital and important, and it's much better to have them than to not have them. But something to keep in mind, as because most or many of you will end up working in the IT field, the only thing which is going to be determining what's the right and wrong thing to do is going to be these very vague codes of conduct. And so sometimes, at the end of the day, who's just going to have to decide what the right thing to do is in for you in that field on a certain day? Yourself. Yeah, there's a sense in which as an IT professional, you have much more power to make your own decisions and much more responsibility because there's less in place. Um, so is everyone on board with that? Just went on longer than I anticipated, but that's the story of my life. So, uh, tied in with this, we're now gonna move on to the next section, which is, this was just general professional ethics stuff. We're now gonna move on to specific sorts of questions that arise in part because there's less uh, regulation and there's less control over the IT profession, which raises questions. 
Uh, so the first thing we're going to be talking about is, um, well, anyone know what this side of the board is about right now? It's, uh, we, can, we can play a fun game called Drawing Thing. Mm -hmm. I know that's that's going the wrong direction. Uh, there we go. Who said whistle blow? <laughs> that's a mouse. <laughs> oh, that's a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a weird one. Yeah, uh, art is. There's a reason I don't teach art. Um, but yeah, whistle blowing. So, what is whistle blowing? What is the practice of blowing a whistle? Yeah, so basically what, here's, um, are companies perfect? No. Sometimes companies do bad stuff by accident, other times companies do bad stuff on purpose. If you know your company is doing something bad, what is generally practice? What are you supposed to do if you don't like it and you want them to stop? Speak up to who specifically? But generally, yeah, generally the first move is you go and talk to the HR department. What's HR? Human relations. It's basically the department that's in charge of like internal policing. So if your boss keeps saying mean things to you, the first thing you're supposed to do is go and talk to the human resources department and be like, hey, this person is making it an unfun workplace for me. We need them to stop. So there's this sense in which, uh, we'll draw it here. Here's you, you're just an ordinary employee and you don't like what's going on, so you talk to a person higher up than you in the chain of command. And if they ignore you, or they don't have the power very often, what do they suggest you do? Just go up a level. And you keep going up and up and up. What's the problem with this? What happens if this person up here says, I don't give a damn? Yeah, you're out of options. So the first thing generally is to stay within the company. And why stay within the company? Well, because that's kind of what you're supposed to do. And two, um, well, keep your job. yeah, you want to keep your job. If a company finds out that you are speaking out against them, then they generally aren't happy about it. Uh, now, this is, so this is the usual chain of command. What is whistleblowing? Yeah, you go outside of the company, and generally you talk to someone else specifically who? The media is the most common one, or I guess in certain sorts of cases with criminal practices, it could be to talk to law enforcement or regulation, but the most common one is media. And so instead of going up through the chain of command, you have to, you instead go and find a journalist and you tell them what's happening inside the company. So why is whistleblowing a moral issue? Why isn't it just like, a, oh, people whistleblow all the time, that's that. I'll give you a clue, it's kind of written on the board somewhere. Yeah, loyalty. So, what do we mean by loyalty? 